All right, nerds, let's get right to it so we can finish this lesson early, and then you could probably tackle the rest of the homework if you did half of it last night, like you should have tackled the homework in class. We are going to finish unit 3.4, which is sine and cosine function graphs. All the vocabulary is exactly the same. The only thing that's different from yesterday is cosine doesn't map the distances from the x-axis, meaning the y-values, the heights. Cosine maps the distance from the y-axis, the horizontal distance, x. So in the unit circle, cosine is x over 1, because instead of saying x over r, we say x over 1, which is just x, because the unit circle radius equals 1. So we have a function this time that literally plots the x values as our angles change, the x values of the unit circle as our angles change. So when you see this x equaling, these are actually your angles. And what we're going to be tracking is the horizontal distance from the y-axis in the unit circle as our angles change. Okay? And just like yesterday, like I said, I don't have the unit circle memorized. I do not use tables of data to graph my trigonometry. I'm only going to write this down in a table of data here because it'll make it easier to talk about increasing, decreasing maximums and minimums. It's the only reason why I'm doing it this way. Just like sine, I graph cosine using the parent function shape and a knowledge of transformations. That is the best way to do it. But here we go. The first two pi, one full circle of the cosine function. Cosine of zero radians. That means you're on the x-axis in the unit circle. And if you're on the x-axis, on the positive x-axis in the unit circle, x is 1, radius is 1, 1 over 1 gives us 1. Now, yesterday we said sine of pi over 6 was 1 half. Well, if you're at pi over 6, that's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So anytime one of them, sine or cosine, is equal to 1 half, the other one is the root 3 over 2. So since sine was 1 half here, cosine will be root 3 over 2 here. And since cosine is root 3 over 2 at the pi over 6, then it's 1 half, 1 over 2 at the pi over 3. At pi over 2, in the unit circle, you're on the y-axis. If you're on the y-axis, there is no x value. The x value is 0, so 0 over 1 gets us this 0. Now, 2 pi over 3 is another pi over 3 triangle, so it is going to have a 1 half value. We just have to ask ourselves, is cosine positive or negative in quadrant 2? Well, in quadrant 2, your x values are negative. So, it is a one-half, but it's negative. At every pi over 6, cosine will give us a root 3 over 2. But this pi over 6 happens to be the one that's in quadrant 2, where x is negative. So it's negative root 3 over 2. At pi radians, you're on the x-axis again in the unit circle, but you're on the negative x-axis. another pi over 6 triangle, which means we're going to have another root 3 over 2. You're in quadrant 3 now, where x is still negative. Another pi over 3 triangle, so another 1 half. You're still in quadrant 3, where x is negative. 3 pi over 2, 270 degrees. That is the negative y-axis in the unit circle doesn't matter if that's negative. The point is, if you're on the y-axis, there is no x value. x is 0 there. So cosine is 0 there. Now we're into quadrant 4. And in quadrant 4, x is positive, which means cosine is positive. I have an over 3, which means I'm going to have a 1 half. I have an over 6, which means I'm going to have a root 3 over 2. 
and 2 pi is the exact same angle as 0, so it gets the same value. There it is. So we've got our table filled out. Yes, ma'am? What do you mean? What do you mean the y value is not affected? For cosine, you mean? Yeah. Well, no, because cosine is x over r. So regardless of whether or not the, of the unit circle, regardless of whether or not the y is positive, x is positive in quadrants 1 and quadrants 4. Quadrants 1 and 4. There we go. So take a peekaboo at this list of numbers and tell me on what interval of x's, meaning what interval of angles, is cosine increasing. Should be able to see it. Uh, those are the y values. Uh, but what x values gets you from negative 1 to positive 1 in the y values? Pi to 2 pi. So here, because this is where my y values are increasing, this is the interval of x's that gets us there. So from pi to 2 pi, cosine is an increasing function. That means it's a decreasing function on the other half of the first circle. So from 0 to pi. We're going from y equals 1 down to y equals negative 1. So from x equals 0 to x equals pi. Remember, College Board AP wants us using brackets on our increasing decreasing. I don't like it, but that's what they want. And maximums, minimums. <clears throat> well, unlike sine that had a single maximum and a single minimum in the first two pi, cosine actually has two maximums in the first two pi if you include zero and you include two pi. But that's because zero and two pi are coterminal and that happens to be where cosine has a maximum. So what I did for period two was rather than restricting myself from zero to two pi, I said on cosine's entire domain, which is all real numbers. And what I did is I looked at how often I was gonna hit y equals one. Zero, two pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi, 10 pi, so on and so forth. So my max values of y equals 1 will occur at you could say 0 plus or minus 2 pi in or you could just get away with 2 pi in. Comma 1. And this of course is where in is an integer. In is an integer. But you know what's a much easier way of saying this? All of the even multiples of pi. That includes zero. So negative four pi, negative two pi, zero pi, two pi, four pi, six pi, eight pi, 26 pi, 158 pi, all of those places cosine has a maximum value of 1. And your minimum, well, in this list of numbers, the minimum occurred at a single place, at pi. But you know it's also going to happen at every coterminal angle to pi. So that's pi plus or minus 2 pi n. I mean, if we're doing it for one of them, we might as well do it for both, right? But if you do 1 plus 2 or 1 minus 2 or 1 plus a multiple of 2, 1 minus multiple of 2, what kind of numbers do you get? Odd numbers. You're always one away from an even number. So this is going to be all the odd multiples of pi. So... 
at 57 pi, I know cosine is at a minimum value of negative 1, because that's an odd number. 57. 103 pi, cosine is negative 1. See? Because I know the cosine patterns. Like I said before I started the video, I feel that graphing cosine is even easier than graphing sine. Here we have the parent cosine wave. It looks like a cup or a bowl. And just like the sine wave, it is cut into four pieces by the four quadrants. So from zero to pi over two is quadrant one. From pi over two to pi is quadrant two. From pi to three pi over two is quadrant three. And from three pi over two to two pi is quadrant four. That means just like sine, the cosine wave has what we can call like the five critical points or something like that. Basically, they're minimums, maximums, and midline hits, just like they were for the sine wave. And you're going to have a minimum, maximum, or midline hit at every one-fourth of a period because that is going to cover one of its quadrants, one-fourth of the period. Just like sine, the amplitude is the distance from the midline to the maximum, or the distance from the midline to the minimum. So that's not, you know, that's from here to here is amplitude, and so is this. Amplitude is always positive but it tells you how far up and how far down you go from the middle. And what else can we say? Mm. So the parent cosine wave, just like the parent sine wave, it begins, quote unquote, at the y-axis. But this one starts at a maximum. Whereas the sine wave starts at the midline and goes up. The cosine wave starts at a maximum. You don't even have to say and goes down because down is the only place you could go from a maximum. So you say the cosine wave starts at a maximum. And because it's periodic, it ends at that maximum also. And this is why I feel like cosine is so easy to graph because it's always going to begin and end at the same place. And what's always halfway between two maximums? A minimum. And what's always halfway between a maximum and a minimum? The a midline hit, which, and, and you, you're not wrong, Ashley said, an inflection point. It happens to also be an inflection point, which brings me to what I was about to ask, concavity. Just like sine, the midline is going to determine the boundaries for your concavity. So where is this graph concave up? No, it's not. The midline determines where concavity changes. So where is it concave up? From, no, so from zero to two pi is, no, it's not concave up from here, but it is concave up from here to here. Because look, that's concave up. So from pi over two to three pi over two, we're concave up. Remember, we don't use brackets on concavity. That means you're concave down elsewhere. <clears throat> so in quadrant one, that's concave down. See it? And in quadrant four, once again, concave down. And then obviously it'll repeat over and over and over again. So like I said, the parent cosine wave starts at a maximum. Starts and ends at a maximum, actually. The domain of every sine and cosine wave is exactly the same. All real numbers. And if it was the parent cosine wave, 
this one, you would see that its range is from negative one to positive one. But that's only because the parent cosine has an amplitude of one. See, it's got a one right here. But if you put another number there, like a two, now your amplitude is two, it goes down to negative two and up to positive two, so your range would be negative two to positive two. If there's a six there, the range would be negative six to positive six. So if there's an A there, what is the range? Negative A to positive A. Whatever that number is. And that's because we're not, in this setup, shifting up and down. Now, clearly, if you shift up and down, your range is going to change. It'll be, let's just say I like put a plus K at the back of this. Then the range would be K plus A or K minus A to K plus A. Because it's A up and A down. <clears throat> Your amplitude is always going to be a positive number. It's the absolute value of whatever number sits in front. And just like sine, cosine's period is supposed to be 2 pi. But if you apply a horizontal dilation, you alter that. But transformations work on all functions the same way. Horizontal dilations always have a 1 over b effect. So our period length would be 2 pi over b. For example, if b was a 2, then the period length would be half of its original value. Because it looks like I'm doubling. No, 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 I'm cutting in half. Remember, horizontal inside opposite. 2 pi over 2 would give you a period length of pi. And the key points, I'm not going to bother writing any letter-based formulas in for that because I don't want you to try to memorize them. Because I don't have them memorized. I just know... They look like that. I literally ask myself, what's it shaped like? Where does it start and end? What's halfway between that? And what's halfway between those? Ta-da! Just like that. For example, skirt. I am not going to use this table. It's a waste of our time. I will tell you, though, what it means by rule. This is just a transformation rule. We did those way back in unit one, I think, where we just described how the transformations affected the X's and described how the transformations affected the Y's. For example, this right here. Is this an X change or a Y change? A Y change. So the rule would be X comma, and what is it doing to the Y's? Yeah, it's just multiplying by 1.5. So you could literally just say, 1.5 times y. Whatever. That's if you need to write a transformational rule. I'm only including that because it's part of the homework. It's old material. I want to graph this thing without having to fill out any table of values, which that's really all this is good for. What do I see? I see a positive cosine wave because it's positive on the front. Positive cosine begins at a maximum. So it looks like this. And since I'm not shifting left and right yet, remember yesterday I said that's called a phase shift in trigonometry? We're not doing that yet. I know that my first point, which will be a maximum, will be on the y-axis. Now all you need to do is figure out the period and the amplitude. Well, the amplitude is 1.5. And my midline is still at zero because I wasn't shifting up and down. That means I already know what my minimum and maximum values are. My maximum is 1.5 up from there and, one point, and minimum is 1.5 down from there. Ta-da. And the period length. 2 pi over the number in front of x, which is 1. Oh, 2 pi. Oh, okay. That means I'm going to begin at a maximum and end at a maximum. So begin at a maximum and two pi away, I reach the next maximum because that's one period. Just like sine, guess what's always halfway between two maximums? A minimum. And just like sine, halfway between a minimum and a maximum is a midline hit. There it is. 
I never evaluate any trigonometry when I'm graphing sine and cosine. I determine shape based on sine or cosine, positive or negative. I determine midline, amplitude, and period. And then I throw them junks on there. It's that easy. And just like yesterday, we'll end with a challenging question. <clears throat> Uh, let's just, let's just write the rule because it's part of the homework and it's part of the AP exam that you know how to write transformational rules. This negative two on the outside, what is it changing? X's or Y's? Y's, what is it doing to the Y's? By what, what? It's multiplying the Y's by negative two. Yeah. Let's talk about the X changes though. What is this doing to my x values? It's multiplying them by 2. Remember, it always has a 1 over b effect. So it looks like it's cutting them in half. It's not. It's doing the opposite of that. It's doubling them. There. So that's the transformational rule. Um, if you want to describe those transformations, I'm not even going to bother. You guys know how to do this. Reflect over x, vertical dilation factor 2, horizontal dilation factor 2. I mean, that's very old material. Hopefully, you've mastered transformations by now. Okay, let's, let's graph this thing. Decide shape. I see a negative cosine. That means my cosine wave is upside down. Now it's a bell shape. Because there's no phase shift, no left-right movement, I know that my beginning point this one here will be on the y-axis and because there's been no vertical shift I know my midline is still the x-axis all right amplitude is two so that means I'm gonna go up two from my midline and down two from my midline I can see my range already do you see how much information you already know without ever even graphing or evaluating any trigonometry? And period length. It's 2 pi over b, which is 2 pi over 1 half. But we've already said that has the effect of doubling the x's. That means it doubles the period to 4 pi. Ready to graph. We start at the y-axis at a minimum. We're there again after 2 pi, excuse me, after one period, which is 4 pi. Halfway between two minimums, you're going to find a maximum. Halfway between a minimum and maximum, you're going to find a midline hit. And there it is. I really hope you're seeing how easy this stuff is. Questions, comments, concerns so far? No? Hey, 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 just giving her a friend a middle finger. That's not nice. <clears throat> All right. Next, not last, because we're going to flip the paper over and do a challenging question challenging question afterwards. I'm going to get you with all the transformations except for a phase shift. Okay. Anyway, let's see what we got going on. Um, you want to write a rule, go for it, whatever. It's going to be, you know what? Let's write the rule. What are we doing to the X's? Nothing. Nothing, Nothing happened to the X's. What are we doing to the Y's though? Multiplying by three and minusing two. And we're going to follow PIMDOS for that. So there's your rule if you care. Vertical dilation factor 3, shift, uh, and then you see a vertical shift of negative 2. It's technically how you would say that. Vertical shift of negative 2. But anyway, let's just get to graphing. That's more important. Transformations is old material. What do we see? We see a positive cosine. Because 
because the three in front is positive. So we're back to our cup or bowl shape. We know there was no phase shifting. I didn't do any left, right shifting. So this maximum right there will be on the X axis. But what we see is that we've been shifted down to, that means our midline is going to be at Y equals negative two. Well, the amplitude is three. You have to go three up from negative two. So one, two, three, that'll find me a maximum value at positive one. And three down from negative two, one, two, three, gets me a minimum value at negative five. The period length is two pi over B, which is over one. So the period length is two pi. Okay. So this maximum on the Y axis is here. You know, after one period, you're back to the maximum. You know that halfway between two maximums, there's always a minimum. Halfway between minimum and maximum, there's always a midline hit. Ta-da. Okay. So much easier than the logarithm, she says. Just you wait until we have to incorporate phase shifting. <laughs> Graphing is really easy as long as there's no phase shifting. Phase shifting is the only thing that can really throw us a wrench in the system. Let's put together a uh, challenging question on the back, shall we? Try to sketch this and i only want you to sketch one period just sketch one period because that's all we've been doing okay i'm gonna be real with you hardest part about this is fractions oh no So go ahead and give that one a try. I'm going to pause the video while you guys are working on it for a moment. Now that we've had some think time, I'm going to go ahead and get started on it. What do I see? I see a negative cosine wave. So this one's going to be bell curve shaped. That. I see a vertical shift of two units. That means my midline has crept up from the x-axis, two units, to y equals two. I could see my amplitude is three. That means I'm going to go up three from this number, down three from this number. You know what? Let me go ahead and throw my y-axis on here and my x-axis. Positive two is going to be my midline. I'm going to go up three to positive five, down three to negative one. That's going to be my maximum Y value. That's going to be my minimum Y value. And since there was no phase shift, this will be at a minimum on the Y axis. Lastly, though, probably the most difficult part is the period length. 2 pi over b. So the period length is pi over 2. Here's how I do this. I go, hey, look, that looks like a period length away. I cut that in half. What's half of pi over 2? Pi over 4. Now I cut my halves in half. What's half of pi over 4? Pi over eight. This is one pi over eight, two pi over eight, three pi over eight, four pi over eight. Literally whatever this one is, you just triple it to get to here. So I cut the period in length in half. I cut the half in half, triple it to get that number. 
and then minimum. We'll hit the minimum again at the end of the period length. Halfway between two minimums will be a maximum. Halfway to a minimum and maximum will be a midline hit. And I could do that with any period length. For example, let's just say I hated you and I made the period length be five pi over six. Let's just say I did that and made you graph it. You would go fine, whatever. Got my X axis right here. Here's five pi over six. You'd cut it in half to get to here. What's half of five pi over six? Come on guys. Five pi over 12, yeah, you just double the bottom. That's how you cut things in half. And then you cut that in half and you would get five pi over 24. Then you would triple it to get to here, 15 pi over 24. Of course, that reduces to five pi over eight, but whatever. The point is, it's that easy. You get here, cut it in half, cut that in half, triple, done. You've got your four X marks. Not bad, right? So fractions is the hardest part because we haven't done any phase shifting yet. And the reason why phase shifting can make things difficult is because the phase shift doesn't necessarily have to play nice with the quarters of your period length. Notice I'm always using quarters of the period. If I phase shift this by pi over eight, pff, life is good. That's freaking easy. That just makes this dot become that dot or that dot become that dot, whatever. But if I phase shift this by like, I don't know, one or a pi over three, now it doesn't line up nicely. And that's why phase shifting becomes a pain in the butt because common denominators and all that stuff. But nerds, that's for another day.